fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. I am the first and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. Folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard, pastor of Bethel Church in Festus, Missouri, and head of prophetic research ministry with another Watchman video broadcast. We're going to go back and we're going to visit our old, almost almost called him our old friend. Uh, he's not my friend. He is our adversary. Uh, his name is Baphomet. Now, I don't know if you remember about a year or so ago, we did a video teaching called Baphomet, the God of Transformation. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to go back, and I'm going to cheat a little bit, and I'm going to revisit some of that material to sort of, uh, sort of refresh our minds, as it were, as to who he is. We're going to know our enemy today, um, all about Baphomet and all about this idea of transformation. Because I saw an article last week that came out, and I saw it, and I went, I know exactly what that is. It just It's almost like... The idea of Baphomet has become reality right in front of our very eyes. So we're going to talk about Baphomet, what he represents, the signs, the symbols that are associated with him. We're also going to look at this idea of transformation. Now, I believe in transformation, and the Bible uses that word. I believe that one of these days, I am going to be changed into an immortal by the power of Jesus Christ through the cross, through the words of this book, I believe that I'm going to be changed, transformed. Let's go to the scriptures and let's look at this transformation process. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. I love this chapter. I love this entire chapter. It talks about Jesus uh, ruling and reigning. It talks about putting all, putting all of his enemies under his feet. It talks about the resurrection itself, how that we must die first. And that it's like a seed being planted in the ground. We don't bury people that are dead so much as we... As we plant them, <clears throat> because out of that seed of this corrupt body, and this body must corrupt, out of that seed rises up a new body that doesn't even look like what you put in the ground. And I like that idea. And then Paul finishes up the idea in verse 51. And I love the fact that my Bible reveals the mysteries. And so Paul said, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. One of these days, this mortal body is going to give way to an immortal body. This flawed physical being that I am right now, this sinful nature that I have, is all going to vanish away, and I will be transformed by the power of Jesus Christ and His resurrection. Romans chapter 1, verse 22 actually uses, in the King James, the word transformed. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, <clears throat> I like to look at opposites. I like to see what the Bible says about one thing, and then you look in the world and you see the exact opposite of that. Let me let me get uh, let me get Marilyn in on this here. Marilyn Ferguson, the author of the Aquarian Conspiracy, uh, and this book with the uh, the tri catch or triple helix logo on here says personal and social transformation in our time. So we're going we're gonna to look at this here for a minute. Here's the opposites here. Here, this book says that we are going to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And our minds are being renewed according to knowledge, according to the knowledge of the Word of God and the wisdom given to us in this sacred book called the Holy Bible. That's the transformation that God has in store for His people. The newage... And I call it newage because it rhymes with sewage. The newage movement says that there is going to be a transformation of mankind. Marilyn Ferguson actually writes in here that it's related to his genetic structure, his genes. 
his chemical makeup, his biology is going to be changed, transformed somehow. And the re instead of a renewing of the mind through the pages of the Bible, I want you to get this. Marilyn says that it's going to take place as a result of a paradigm shift. We're going to see some things related to that here in a little bit as we revisit this material to see just how relevant it is. Where do you see the article that came out last week that showed me that Baphomet was real? Okay, Not just some make-believe thing. He's real. He's the God of transformation. So a paradigm shift is going to take place. Something's going to happen on the earth and everybody, everybody that's not in line with this Bible is going to turn and they're going to look at this Bible and say, this is junk. We don't want anything to do with it anymore. It's already happening. It's already happening in the church. What a shame that is. It's happening in the church because the Bible says, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. By the way, that's what, that's what Joseph Smith said he saw, an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their work. So here, the Bible is laying out an idea that there is a change a coming. It's, it's in the air. A transformation is just ahead of us. If you listen to the political uh, speeches, if you listen to the TV shows and the movies, and you listen to the commercials, and then you listen to the preachers preach and the language they're using, they're all talking about a shift is going to take place, a transformation. Some, everything is going to change. Barack Obama um, campaigned on this idea of change. We're going to change everything in this world. <sighs> Fasten your seatbelts because the transformation process is, is pretty rough. Okay, uh, It's pretty rough. So plant your feet on solid ground, build your house upon the rock, and you'll be fine. But it says here in this verse that, number one, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And then number two, he said, no marvel if his ministers are also transformed into the ministers of righteousness. And I want you to, I want you to kind of think about this for a minute. The Bible says in, in 1 Peter that we who are born again, who are saved uh, by the blood and by the incorruptible seed of the Word of God, those of us who are born again, um, we, are a, we are a nation, a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices unto God. And I want you to think about the opposite then. If Satan is transformed and his people are transformed, it says here that they shall be, uh, there is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed. His ministers, let's say these, these sub devils that all operate under, under Lucifer. And then all of the people, all of the people that are trans, that are transformed by the New Age movement and by the secret cults and all of this stuff. They're transformed. They also wish to offer sacrifices. Who, who are they going to go for? Who are they going to go after? Who are they going to try to sacrifice? Thus brings in this idea of persecution of God's people. It's coming down the road as the world grows ever darker and turns more toward Lucifer and away from the Ten Commandments and away from the God of the Bible. They become, Jesus said, number one, twofold the child of hell. And number two, they become the fierce enemies of those who follow the Lord Jesus Christ. That's just kind of what we've got to look forward to down the road. But if that bothers you, then look past that and see the glory that awaits us on the other side. So this image of Baphomet that we have seen, we're going we're gonna to break this down. This goat, half human, half goat, this half male, half female, the horns, the fingers, the DNA, all of this stuff we're going to look at. But I saw it become reality. I want you to notice in Baphomet's image that he is, a, he is called the androgynous God. Andro meaning man, gynous meaning woman. The androgynous, the fusion of male and female in the body of a goat. Look at the story. 
Goy. It's a girl goat in a boy goat's body. Ag research experiments on genetically modified goats. Let me stop right here. Genetically modified. Everything now is becoming genetically modified. We've genetically modified the seeds by way of Monsanto and other companies. We have genetically modified the cows, the pigs, the mice, the rats, the rabbits, the goats, the sheep. The genetic modification of humanity is literally just around the corner, and the corner is really, really close here. Uh, and God said, don't do it. God said, don't do it. See, this goes back to this DNA thing, and I, I don't want to revisit this too much. This idea of DNA is the book that God wrote. God wrote it out and said, leave it alone. Don't add to it. Don't take it away. Don't alter it. Don't diminish from it. Don't mess with my book that I wrote. And so scientist says, oh, wow, what a neat book. I don't like the way it's written. We're going to rewrite it. So ag research experiments on genetically modified goats have resulted in the animals producing mostly transgender offspring, which are being milked to find out whether they carry the intended human protein. Here, stop right here again. I'm reading this and I'm thinking of scripture after scripture um, to deal with this thing. Number one, the transgender issue, we're gonna deal with that. Number two, this idea of producing milk. It is the opposite, listen to this now, here is the milk of the word of God, okay? A land that flows with milk and honey flows with the sweetness and the purity of the milk of the word of God. This is the milk of God right here to feed our souls. And the devil says, you know, let's, I'm gonna mess with that a little bit. And so here this idea of milk, feeding people, giving them nourishment and altering the genetic structure. Uh, the article says the goats have been bred on the state science company's uh, Raukura facility in Hamilton. I think this is in New Zealand, where experiments are being done to create pharmaceuticals. Think about it. Soil and Health New Zealand spokesman Stephen Browning, who recently toured the facility, said 75% of the goats were females in sterile male bodies. Ag research staff referred to them as goys, the combination or the fusion of girls and boys. So let's look at Baphomet again very quickly. We notice that he is, he has female parts, he has male parts, he is part goat, part uh, human. He has, he has wings, therefore that shows the, significant, this, uh, the signification of him being an angelic being fused into the body of a human being. The hand pointing up, the hand pointing down, the three horns, we're going to talk about the pentagram, we're going to talk about all of those things. Um, Baphomet, this term Baphomet, this is uh, from Encyclopedia Americana. This is from Encyclopedia Americana. Baphomet signifies Baphometeos, baptism of metis or baptism of fire or the Gnostic baptism and enlightening of the mind. Remember what we said. Baphomet being the god of transformation, transformation has everything to do with the mind. The Bible can either change your mind and change your attitude and change your heart toward God's way, or there's going to be a great big gigantic paradigm shift that's going to take you away from the Bible, and you're going to say, I don't believe that book anymore. The Bible is full of, in fact, in fact, when Dan Brown, let me pull Dan, Danny Boy in here, when Dan Brown wrote uh, The Da Vinci Code, there was an agenda in the Da Vinci Code. And I caught it. I mean, there was a bunch of stuff in there. This is not the Da Vinci Code. This is uh, the lost symbol. Uh, when, when he wrote the Da Vinci Code, there was an agenda. And that agenda was to convince people that this Bible was not true. Okay? So the, it's working. And people are disbelieving the Bible more and more. I wonder what it's going to be. I can speculate and I can guess. And I don't like to do that because I don't like being wrong. But I wonder what's going to happen that is literally going to shift the entire scheme of humanity and they're going to think and believe that this Bible is not true. God says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 11, number 11 is the number for confusion. God says, he shall, therefore he shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That is the paradigm shift that's coming just down the road. So this idea that uh, this Baphomet image represents the transformation 
um, of people's thoughts and people's minds um, is absolutely incredible. This idea of Baphomet representing the enlightening of the mind, that's the paradigm shift. That is the transformation of people's minds. That is this baptism of fire that mankind is about to go into. Let's look at what else the Bible says. We see that Baphomet is, is part beast and part human. And here's an interesting thing. We see in Revelation 13, we see a beast rising up out of the sea. He has seven heads and ten horns and all the crowns. And he's like a lion and a leopard and a bear. And a dragon's giving him all of his power. And this is real interesting to me in reading Genesis chapter 1. Look at verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Let me stop right here. We're going to talk about it in a little bit. We're going to talk about those who believe that God is both male and female. That is a heresy. We know now which God that is. It's not the same God that's the God of this Bible. And they use this verse as a reference, saying, well, God, God created man in his image. See, we don't, have to, we don't have to go any farther than that. The Bible says it's his image. I wonder why the NIV committee is so staunch and adamant about re even replacing their own NIV with a gender-neutral Bible that neutralizes the gender of God the Father. I think it has something to do with Baphomet. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. It does not say that God is male and female and created man, a male and female, in an androgynous body. God created male. God created female. Two separate processes, actually. Okay? He took a rib from Adam and he created a female from that. His exact opposite. That's what God did. Verse 28, And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the every living thing that moveth upon the earth. The interesting thing about Baphomet is God gave man dominion over all the beasts of the earth. And now we're looking at a situation in the last days where it looks like now that beasts are going to have dominion over man. Let's look at how this takes place. We look at Baphomet. We see that he is part human and part beast. Daniel chapter 2, verse 43. We've talked about this many times in relation to the fourth kingdom which represents principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places, these cherubs or these uh, cherubim, these angelic realm beasts that are devils, that are evil angels, the Bible calls them. This is the fourth kingdom that Daniel refers to. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, the miry clay is human beings, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with miry clay. We're literally going to see a time when mankind is going to be mingled with these, with these beasts, these devils, these gods, these evil angels, literally inside of his DNA. This Baphomet image truly represents the transformation of mankind. Did you ever see the, the movie? It's an old movie, The Island of Dr. Moreau. The island of Dr. Moreau was about this, this evil scientist on this island that was fusing humans and animals together. Think about the Twilight series. Think about this whole idea of a werewolf, a man and a beast in the same body, in the same genetic structure. It's, that's what that's referring to. This is why you shouldn't be reading in books like that and going to movies like that. That's why you shouldn't be doing it. It's actually preaching... A false gospel. Here we have a, a vampire who is a living, dead person. Do you see the opposites here? Anyway, this idea of the transformation of mankind that the New Age movement talks about is directly related to the transformation of his DNA. Literally minging this, mingling this beast, animal, dragon, whatever you want to call it, seed, into the very DNA of man. This was typified in Nebuchadnezzar himself. So for a period of the Bible calls seven times, and I think that might be a reference to seven years, for a period of this time, Nebuchadnezzar, look what the Bible says, let his heart be changed from man's 
and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. This, I believe, is what was referenced in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, when the Bible talks about the man of sin, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God. The New Testament plainly tells you that the temple of God is this body that God himself has built. Literally, the beast is going to dwell. Let me stop and think about it. I have, as a born-again Bible-believing Christian, I have the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ dwelling in me, ruling my temple, my tabernacle, the Word of God being the rule book that guides and leads this little kingdom that's going on inside of my heart. Then we look at the opposite. We clearly see here that the beast is ruling, not from necessarily a geographic location, although I believe Jerusalem is part of that, but literally on the inside of human beings. He is reigning as God from the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's the lie the paradigm shift that everybody is going to believe. And notice how the Bible describes the false prophets of the last days who are leading the cause. Remember, remember a beast rises up out of the earth in Revelation chapter 13. And he, he kind of looks like a lamb. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, six things, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And the cause, those who are bringing about the cause are the false prophets and false teachers of the last days. Those whose conscience have been seared with a hot iron. They deceive others and they deceive themselves. And Peter described them in Second Peter chapter 2. But these, as natural, brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in what? In their own corruption. How did they get corrupt? They were born again. Not of incorruptible seed, which is the word of God. They were born again. They had a paradigm shift. They had a great awakening by corruptible seed. That's what that means. They're going to perish in their own corruption. But he refers to them as natural brute beasts. So this idea of Baphomet. And here, and just think about this. Hear this. This, this uh, agricultural research farm in New Zealand produces, literally, I mean, it wasn't a monkey, it wasn't a rat, it wasn't a rabbit, it wasn't a dog, it wasn't a cricket, it wasn't a cow. It was a goat. And they, the article went on to say that, well, it was kind of, you know, kind of accidental. We don't know how it happened. It just happened that way. I don't think it was accidental at all. I think there is a cause that is taking place. It was on. It was, it was purpose driven. Okay. Um, and a goat that now produces milk to feed people. That is both male and female. If you look at again at the image of Baphomet, you'll see that this goat human has breasts to produce milk to feed. People, not with the incorruptible word of God, but with the corruptible seed, the corruptible milk. The words uh, that Paul spoke about uh, when he was referring to Hymenaeus and Philetus. And he said, their words doth eat as a canker, literally a cancer. The true word of God will preserve you and keep you and give you eternal life. The corrupted seed, the corrupted words are cancerous. And they're like sour milk and they will destroy so literally we are having baphomet right in front of our very eyes this god of transformation epitomized i believe i believe this is a sign the birth of the male and the female goat together in exodus chapter 22 we have this verse it's in the 72nd chapter of the Bible, and you've heard me talk about this number 72 quite extensively. Um, the 72nd chapter of the Bible gives a, a strong warning. Whosoever lieth with a beast shall surely be put to death. Now, God wasn't 
kidding. He was, he was dead serious. God also talked about how you're not supposed to gender cattle of a diverse kind. You're supposed to keep the genders separate. You're supposed to keep them away from one another and not allow them to procreate and produce these various strains. You're not to mingle the seed in the field. You're not even to wear a woolen coat and a linen coat. One, of course, linen made out of vegetable material and woolen made from animal material. You, God said you're not supposed to wear them together. It's, it's confusion. It's, the word con means with and fusion. With fusion. It's confusion. And God said don't do it. Don't mingle these things together. This is exactly what's going on. And God said, you're not to lie, man or woman, carnally with a beast. We go back to Genesis chapter 6. The God, literally those beast angels lying, taking wives of human women. We're seeing that taking place right now. Look at this. Here's an article from 2008. We have created animal human embryos already, says a British team. Here's another one. Health Secretary Alan Johnson. This is uh, from Great Britain. DNA mix hem- embryos won't create Frankenstein babies. No, it would be much worse than that. That was uh, from uh, 2008. And now we're, we've moved forward three years now from 2008. And we're hearing constantly about the mixture of animals and humans and the, and the mixturing and the mixing of the genetic structure and the altering of man's DNA, linking it with animal DNA. We're just literally right around the corner from the transformation of mankind. And now, we, now we've given birth to the Baphomet goat. The goat that is both male and female. And it's interesting. It was interesting to me. This idea of a goat. Goats are not sheep. And our shepherd knows the difference, doesn't he? You see, I'm one of these. I think there's a lot of people in churches every Sunday that are playing church. I mean, you you know that, don't you? I did at one time, and maybe you have too. The shepherd knows the difference. He knows the difference between the sheep and the goats. He knows the difference between the wheat and the tares. See, the enemy has come in and sown tares in the field. With, along with the incorruptible seed, he's sown in all these tares in the field. And the, the laborers went to the master and said, Hey, you know, what are we going to do with this? And the master said, Let it grow. Let it grow. When it's time for harvest, we'll separate it all out. And we'll take the wheat and we'll store it in the house of my father. But we'll take the tares and we'll cast them into the fire so that they'll burn. Think about it. Separating the sheep from the goats. Matthew chapter 25. And before him shall be gathered all nations... And he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. That word nation has to do with ethnicity, has to do with, um, and I don't want you to think that I'm thinking, well, all the black people are going to be over here and all the white people are going to be over here. This ethnicity thing has everything to do with the Bible word generations, literally their genetics their genes, their DNA structure. Before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. And there is something interesting I want to show you here from the Bible. Uh, This just came to me. Matthew chapter uh, 25 is where Jesus records all of this about the sheep and the goats. And I want us to count. We like to count things. And I want us to count this pattern in the scripture. And uh, I want you to notice that here's, here's the criteria for separating the sheep from the goats. We're going we're gonna to count this. Verse 34, uh, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, this is the sheep, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. See that number six again? Small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. There's that number six again. Genesis chapter six, the fusion 
of the angelic world and the human world, of the beast and the human. And this is their criteria, six things that the shepherd uses to separate the sheep from the goats. And the same thing here is uh, uh, in verse 41 concerning the goats. Depart from me, ye cursed. Notice he calls the sheep the blessed, and he calls the goats the cursed. Into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Sick, and in prison. Six things here. Okay? Six things. This number six, very important. The hexagram, the fusion of two opposites together. This is what our Heavenly Father, whose Son, Jesus Christ, the Great Shepherd, is going to do at the last days. He's going to know who the sheep are. He's going to go know who the goat is. He's going to know who the goats are in the last days. And then we get to this idea of Baphomet being the androgyny. The male and female fused together in the same body. And I mentioned it before, this false doctrine floating around. That God was male and female, and still is. And that when he created Adam, he created Adam to be in his image, the androgynous God. Not so. That is not so, according to the King James Bible. But I see in this idea a doctrine, a day coming. When the God of androgyny will recreate man in his slash her image. That's what I see. Um, a quote. And you may already know the answer to who said this. This is a quote from a tell evangelist. Then he created Eve out of Adam. Now, actually, God didn't name her Eve. Adam named her Eve later. That wasn't her name. Her name was Adam. Adam. When God said Adam, they both came. Their authority was one and the same together. Now, let me, let me stop right here. This doctrine is what allows a lot of... Boy, I don't want to just categorize them all as Pentecostal slash charismatic but it's in the liberal Christianity realms as well. But this doctrine here is what allows uh, those who believe in female pastors and preachers and bishopettes to circumvent the Bible. The Bible! When the Bible says, let the women keep silence in the churches, they say, well, that doesn't mean it, because, you know, we're really, we have the same authority. That's where that comes from. So the likes of Joyce Myers and Paula White and uh, all of these other uh, preacherettes who are standing up behind pulpits usurping authority over their husbands instead of learning at home, this is where they get it from because they really believe that it's all the same. Their authority was one and the same together. They had always been together. Even when she was still part of him, he was as much female as he was male like God is. Who said that? Kenneth Copeland. People have even argued about whether God is male and female. But the Bible, says, but the Bible itself tells us that he's both. Stop right here. No, it doesn't. Not this one. You'll never read that in there. You will never ever read that God is both male and female in this Bible right here. You'll never read that. However, if you start reading the new NIVs that are coming out, it makes an allowance for that doctrine by neutralizing the gender of God. He goes on. He says, in the Hebrew language, stop right here. This is called private interpretation. No prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, which means translation. And so what Copeland does is he goes, he doesn't even give you the word. He goes and says, now in the original Hebrew, does that sound familiar to you? You've, you've sat in a church and the pastor said, now in the original Greek, this is what this really means. That's a license that we don't have. And so Copeland says, oh, in the original Hebrew, in the original Hebrew, here's, here's what it really should have said in your Bible. He is setting himself up like the Pope who has authority even above the Scriptures. In the Hebrew language, all words have gender. They're either male or female. But the Hebrew word Jehovah is both masculine and feminine. No, it's not. He's as much female as he is male and he is as much male as he is female. Boy, these uh, false prophets being natural brute beasts just kind of takes on a whole new meaning, doesn't it? 
Look, we quoted these verses a while ago. Deuteronomy 22, 5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination to the Lord thy God. And I have seen preachers. And they did it like as a joke. You know, they're jesting. Wearing women's makeup and a woman's dress in some little comedy skit. I don't, I don't go for that. I don't, there, there are not any pictures of me ever floating around on the internet in a dress. Okay? Deuteronomy 22, 9. Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with divers seeds, diverse seeds. Lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown and the fruit of thy vineyard be defiled. Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. Thou shalt not wear a garment of divers sorts such as woolen and linen together. God was serious about this thing. And then we get into this whole transgendered movement. Transgenderism, everything now. And we're favoring, we're favoring transgender. There was, oh, oh, I can't get the image out of my mind. There was on Drudge Report last week, and I'm not even going to put the picture up. There was a picture on Drudge Report last week of a man, a man, who went to the airport dressed in a woman's bra and panties and nothing else. Went through security, boarded a plane, flew to the destination, got off, and nobody said a word. I would have said a word. Transgender movement, the transgender issue, fusing the line between male and female or fusing them together. This, you, now you know what spirit is driving this. When we start accommodating and the laws, the laws now that are being written or being considered or being jammed down our throat have everything to do with the spirit of transgenderism, which we now know is Baphomet, if they can create a goat that is both male and female and they have no problem with it, we're, we're just around the corner, literally, from a transformation. Uh, the horns of Baphomet. I want you to see, a lot of this stuff that I'm pointing out to you is simple. If you just stop and think about it, you may say, well, I don't, you know, I look at this, I don't know what all this means. Um, and uh, Marilyn talks about, well, actually, uh, actually, our, get, let us get Fat Albert Pike here. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, here is Albert Pike, and he talks all about symbols in this book. I mean, symbols and symbols and symbols. And uh, every chapter has a symbol to it. It's a, a reference. So here's one that's a key. Oh, wow, think about that, Revelation 9. Um, and, they, and, and Pike will tell you in this book, um, all those th all those symbols we use in Freemasonry, to those of you in the Blue Lodge, uh, we told you what they meant. <laughs> we we were lying. We, we, it, that's not really what they meant. And a lot of Freemasons get mad when you question Freemasonry. They get mad because they say, "Nope, that's not how it is." Well, their Grand Master, the guy, and 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 anybody that says, "Well, we don't follow Albert Pike," really then dig his body up out of the uh, house of the Temple Lodge in Washington, D.C. and go put it somewhere else because according to the big boys in Washington, D.C., they still follow this guy and they revere him and he is one of the two pillars of Jacob and Boaz that is buried inside of the house of the Lodge Temple in Washington, D.C. But Albert Pike says all these symbols that we have, like the double-headed eagle and all that stuff, and we tell you that it means this, and we tell you square and compass is that the mason, that means the mason is to circumscribe his his conduct with some blah, 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 blah. Albert Pike says, we lied. We didn't tell you the truth. We actually misled you, and we did it on purpose, because the mysteries and the secrets that we know, we can't tell anybody unless you're one of us. Okay? God actually reveals all these things, and a lot of these things are just real simple. And I want you to think about horns. Horns always take on the DNA spiral shape. So think about that for a minute. And actually, what we're looking at here is very similar let me get my book out here. It's very, very, very similar. In fact, it really, literally means the same as this here. Here is the two lower horns, and here's the third horn in the middle. This is man's DNA as it is now, two strand. This is the addition of the third strand here. So look at this. And it has everything to do with the number three. For all that is in the world, <coughs> the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Did you count those? There's three. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not 
of the Father, but is of the world. And so the power, uh, you know, that you know, you think of a, a goat and and the power of a goat being in his horns. The power of the goat right now, or that spirit of Antichrist. Um, with the two horns is not powerful enough. It needs that third horn to be all powerful and all encompassing. And those three horns represent the man of sin, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life literally encoded into man's DNA. The structure of those horns is similar to the idea of the union of opposites, male and female together, Okay, sons of God, daughters of men. See the opposites there, sons of God, up the heavenly realm, daughters of men. Okay, they're exactly opposites in every way. And yet they come together like, like uh, Osiris and Isis. And they come together and the result of their union together is the birth of a son. Ichabod. Ichabod comes to mind. The birth of a son. The Ichabod means the glory is departed. Ichabod, the birth of Ichabod had everything to do with pointing to a last day's time when literally the glory of God is going to be departed. Why? Because the God of this world now rules and man has made his choice. So we have the birth. We have the coeptus, the Anuit coeptus. He favors the birth Novus Ordo Seclorum, of a new world order. And that's what the third in the middle represents. It represents the birth and the coming of the man of sin, Horus, Apollo, all of these other things. It represents a new birth. You see it in the uh, right angle triangle. The idea, you'll see this in Masonic literature, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. In other words, the sum of the square of line A plus the sum of the square of line B equals the sum of the square of line C. See, I say, I'm, I'm not a math genius. I hate this stuff. But I looked at that and I'm going, I get that. Because A squared equals Osiris. B squared equals Isis. And when you sum them together, they add up to the birth of Horus. You see that in the layout of Washington, D.C., the White House, Washington's Monument, the Capitol Building. It's very magical. It's called geomancy. It's called this idea that if we build it, they will come. Uh, in the Masonic Lodge, you have the junior warden, the senior warden, and there in the midst of the junior and the senior warden, you have an exalted throne where, listen to this now, the worshipful master sits. And you have to call him that. You can't call him, hey, Bob, hey, Frank. You, you can't, when you go in the lodge, you can't say, Hey, Tom, you can't do that. You must refer to him as the worshipful master. Think about it. Jesus himself is the one who used the words master when he said no man can serve two masters. Um, in Gothic cathedrals, see the two doors on one side and the other, male and female, they have fused together and now you have the third door in the middle, and that represents the birth of a new world order. I've even seen this in a lot of churches. This is actually uh, a church. The, the Masonic Lodge is about two doors down from this place on the same block, same, same road, same street. Uh, the bottom parts of the unfinished pyramid represent two-strand DNA. The top part represents... The completion of that structure. It's like the Tower of Babel. It's unfinished. The, the work is not done yet. Okay? Um, it needs help. And one of these days it's going to get help. It's going to be the addition of the Antichrist in the last days. And then, right, oh, I like this one. Right, right, right here. Right on his forehead. Or this, maybe in this case, it would be a five head. Um, we have the pentacle or the pentagram. Lockheed Martin uses that symbol. The, the Pentagon building and Lockheed Martin, let's see, they work for the Pentagon. And their logo says, we never forget who we're working for. Oh, I get it. Because that pentagram is related to Isaiah chapter 14. This number five. It, it also points to death too. In Genesis chapter five, you have a repeated pattern of death. Adam was mentioned five times and the fifth time he's mentioned, the Bible says he died. Seth, the same thing. The pattern is carried down through until you get to Enoch. He breaks the pattern, but then it picks up again until Noah. And the fifth time Noah's name is mentioned, the Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. 
And I like that. Noah got to live when everybody else died. This is number five, the law. The five books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch is what it's called. And the law, the Bible, Paul referred to it as the law of sin and death. You see, if you try to live by the law, it'll kill you because there's a curse there. Christ removed the curse by being pierced. One, two, three, four at his feet, the fifth time in his side. I like this, but we have Satan's five point plan. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, the angelic realm. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, that's the church realm, in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And number five, I will be like the most high. You see that image on the satanic Bible. Rock bands use that. I mean, everybody is using, and, it, and listen now, listen, it will not surprise me to see the pentagram being used in the church at some point, very subtly. In fact, I think it already is. Look at this. And here's, and here's, let's get back to this idea of transformation. This pentagram represents the power of Lucifer being, being brought to the earth. Uh, the Pentagon thing on 9-11 where you had the symbol of the male airplane flying into the symbol of the female pentagram the fusion of the opposites giving birth to a new world order giving birth to the transformation of mankind notice the pattern because we started out with this earlier we started out with this idea of uh, transformation being when we are taken up into heaven Paul said that in 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a, number one, a shout. Number two, the voice of the archangel. Number three, the trump of God. Number four, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Number five, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. It is about transformation. Now, Manley Hall describes the pentagram this way. He says, the pentagram is the figure of the microcosm, the magical formula of man. It is the one rising out of the four. Let me stop right here. Let me explain to you what those four are. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, thiamine. That is the four base pairs of your DNA. And there is one who will rise out of the four. The human soul rising from the bondage of the animal nature. It is the true light, the star of the morning. It marks the location of five mysterious centers of force, the awakening of which is the supreme secret of white magic. You see here, this sort of looks like uh, Da Vinci's Vitruvian man, the transformed God man, uh, whose five points, the head rising up out of the four base pairs. Here are, and, and basically that references man's DNA in his X chromosome. So when you see the symbol of the skull and bones, notice the bones crisscross pattern. That is man's four base pairs on, and his chromosomes, which look like crosses, and the skull rising out of that. Let's see, President Bush and President Bush and John Kerry and scores, hundreds of others belonging to a secret society called the Order of Skull and Bones? And they're Christians? I don't think so. But anyway, the skull is a symbol for the Antichrist. Jesus was crucified at the place of the skull, the cross being driven into the skull like the nail being driven into Sisera's head. The skull is an emblem of the Antichrist, the one rising out of the four. And you have the the five elements, earth, air, fire, water, and then spirit. And spirit is that fifth element that rises out of the four. And that's the basis for elemental magic. Magic, magic is sort of like the force of Star Wars, which you ought not play with. The force of Star Wars and ele elemental magic are exactly identical the same. Because witches say, oh, we're not, we're not, we're not using devils. That's so silly. We're using the powers that be in nature, earth, air, fire, and water. We're just using them to do good things. This is why Wicca is such an attraction, especially to young girls who want power. They want control. And they will use the elementals to bring about their magic. Look at this Dow Chemical advertisement talking about the human element. Um, 
we have the emblem of DNA on Baphomet. And we've talked about this before and how all of these all of these groups, all of these businesses, all of these think tanks, all you'll hear in advertising talking about how it's in our DNA. Uh, the game is in us. It's in our DNA. Here's one uh, uh, from Bentley. Okay. Hard work is in our DNA. Time Magazine put out an article called The God Gene. Does our DNA compel us to seek a higher power? Believe it or not, some scientists say yes. They say there's something in our DNA that's going to come out. Diversity is in our DNA. Um, that deals with the idea of transhumanism. That we have our four base pairs. Something is going to be added or rise out of that that is going to take us to the next level. Okay, we've we've been see. This is why evolution is so dangerous and it's so idiotic. If you believe, if you want to believe it, even theistic evolution don't believe that. It's not biblical. It's not right. Um, but evolution says that man started out way down here, and he's been he's had all these paradigm shifts. You see, he, he, he watch for this, because the the uh, the scientists who teach all this stuff about evolution and the evolution of man. One of the things that they're having a really, 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 really hard time doing is that any time they say, well, this, this here was a Neanderthal man and this here is Cro-Magnon man, what they don't have are the transitional species between this and this. So you know what they're going to say? They're maybe already saying it now. They're going to say that evolution is brought about by a dramatic, cataclysmic event that makes the DNA change suddenly rather than progressively. That's a setup for the paradigm shift. Uh, humanity plus, other terms like this, Ray Kurzweil coming out and talking about how that we are going to be immortal in the next, let's say the next 30 to 40 years, mankind is going to be a god. It's exactly what Lucifer promised in the Garden of Eden. Here we go. New movie coming out. You're always going to see this stuff in the movies. Okay, and actually, Marilyn Ferguson actually wrote about that. She said, "We yeah, we've got film producers. They're putting the putting all these secrets in there." Um, Planet of the Apes, the new one. Okay, it's a sequel to the original, which was a remake of the old one. Um, but the, I saw the trailer, the theatrical trailer to Planet of the Apes. And I'm watching this and I'm going, okay, I get this. This is not about apes becoming human. This is about humans becoming gods by manipulation in man's DNA. And during the course of the theatrical trailer, what you see is this phrase, revolution, or excuse me, evolution equals revolution. A change is coming. Revolution and evolution. There is no evolution without a revolution. And this is, I mean, you see this in the church. Here's a book called Decoding the Church, Mapping the DNA of Christ's Body. Uh, the D6, con by the way, D6 Conference. This is something that the Free Will Baptists through Randall House Publications are putting on every year. Um, instead of going with the Bible, they're going with all the New Age concepts. D and 6. The letter D is the number 4. 46. The 46 conference coming up last year said, how do I change the DNA of our church? You know how to change the DNA of your church? Quit using this Bible and start using all the other ones. Th then you change it because the Bible is the DNA of the church people. Okay, It's all about DNA, transformation. It's about, remember I mentioned this word a while ago, the word confusion. Con means with. Fusion means melded together. It's about fusion. The symbol of Baphomet holding his hand up and hand down as above, so below. The male and the female uh, together in the same body. The man and the beast. It's about fusion. If you look at the symbols, look at what's going on in the world. Everything is about fusion. Uh, advertisements, car names, software, drinks. And they're trying to plant, even Glenn Beck is in on the scene. Glenn Beck, the Mormon, who believes that through the union of the male and the female that the two people become gods. His magazine, Fusion, he's about the transformation and the change of America. Building, upon, building America upon the foundation 
of not necessarily the Mormon church, even though that's what he is, but the doctrine that says man is going to become gods through sacred marriage, the fusion of the husband and wife uh, together. You even have all these fusion centers all over the country where they're taking the different departments that are keeping their eye on everything that you're doing and fusing all the information together. We have this, we have infusion church, fusion church, better to notice the symbol of fusion church. There it is right there. Okay. Uh, fusion this, fusion that. Fusion elements. What is your element? Building upon the elemental magic. Fusion magazine. It's the idea of that thesis versus antithesis. In other words, you have thesis, which is one concept, and antithesis, which is the exact opposite concept. And they're fused together to form what's called synthesis. The new synthetic man, the synthetic doctrines going through the church, synthetic ideas. It's all about fusion, and it starts by being symbolized by a goat that is a synthetic goat producing synthetic milk to feed people so that we become synthetic ourselves. The fusion of male and female together. The symbols, the symbols are all there. Notice the fusion that me and you fuse together will lead us to God. Um, the fusion of opposites in our country. The Tea Party movement, or the or the uh, the, the the conservatives, or the uh, you know people like that, clashing against the Marxists and the liberals in this country. There needs to be a catalyst, and there's going to be one of these days. A catalyst, something that's going to spark and ignite all of this stuff, and the two opposites are going to clash, and there's going to be a fusion in this country, a paradigm shift led about by a president who ran on the promise of transformation. Um, again, back to this D6 conference. You'll see in the church realm everything talking about a shift, a shift. Notice the hand gestures of Baphomet, solve and coagula. I've dealt with this before. Solve means to dissolve. Coagula means to coagulate or rebuild it. I want you to notice the fingers on his right hand pointing up. You have two fingers pointed down and three fingers, fingers pointed up. That is the number 23. Notice on the opposite hand pointing down, you have two fingers pointing up and three fingers pointed down. That is still the number 23, which is 46. It's the number of chromosomes that, where our DNA is stored. It's all about man's DNA. But the fusion of these two things together and how is it going to work? You have to dissolve first. So we have a financial crisis. We have a health care crisis. We have buildings falling down. We have the environment that is going to collapse. The sky is falling right over us right now. We're all going to die in 30 years. Major catastrophes, earthquakes in diverse places tsunamis, natural disasters, tornadoes, God speaking through the whirlwind people. All these cataclysmic events are meant to dissolve so that new things can rise up in their place. And how is it done in the church realm? It starts out with dissolving the word of God by saying, Yea, hath God said. This goes back a hundred or year so hundred years or so. Back inside the church realm, when you had Westcott and Hort, who wanted to introduce a brand new Bible based upon corrupt seed, corrupted manuscripts, thus bringing in the doctrines that floated through all the Bible colleges and seminaries. And now it's in the pulpits, and now it's in the minds of the church member who says, well, the Bible really doesn't say that. Not in the originals, no. Okay, it doesn't really say that. Yea, hath God said. What that has done is that has dissolved the faith of people who should have believed the Bible. And when you dissolve it, you've got to coagulate it. You've got to rebuild it. Frank Viola and George Barna wrote two books. The first book was called Pagan Christianity. Pagan Christianity, by their own admittance, was an attempt to tell the church member that all the things that we're doing in a church, like a pastor speaking behind a pulpit and taking up an offering and you know folding our hands to prayer and all this, they're telling you that everything that we're doing in our church services is all pagan. Why are you doing this stuff? You're worshiping false gods. And they admitted that that was an attempt to dissolve the sacred structures of the church worship. They were trying to tear it down, dissolve it, solve it. 
then you have to coagulate something in it. You have the rising of the phoenix, the phoenix rising up out of the dissolved remains, the ashes of what it used to be, resurrection, transformation, coagula, building something in its place. So Lucifer says, the serpent says, yea, hath God said. He just dissolved the word of God. Now he's going to re-coagulate by saying, ye shall not surely die. Ye shall be as gods. You see how it works? Salve coagula. The goy. The goat who is male and female. A new one rising up in its place. New world order to save the earth. Reimagining church. Here's the book that they wrote. Once they've dissolved the old structures of church worship, now they're going to reimagine what the church is going to look like. Imagination. How did they build the Tower of Babel? They imagined it. Go read that. God said, I have to put a stop to this because everything that they now imagine to do, they'll do. That's how the Tower of Babel was. That's how they designed it. They reimagined something. And now we're reimagining the church. Everything in the church now is about imagining, dreaming, conceptualizing, fantasizing rebuilding the church, redoing it once it's been dissolved. And it's the same way with the political structures, the financial structures, the health care structure. Every structure in this world is about to be dissolved, maybe soon. And they have to do that so they can put a new one in its place. You have to bring down the two towers, Jacob and Boaz, 9-11. You have to dissolve. And boy, they were. They were dissolved. Literally. And if you believe the story... Um, Osama bin Laden was caught on tape saying he never thought that it would be that bad. Maybe it was. Maybe he was right. Maybe, maybe he never thought that. But the God of transformation did. And so the old ones were dissolved and a new one now is rising up in its place. See how it works? The God of transformation. Let's go back to Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Sacrifice yourself, and then be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The word translation comes into effect here. Colossians chapter 1, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us, to, made us meet to be partakers in the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the powers of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. That word translation, we're going to see it. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And here it is, Hebrews 11 verse 5. Remember that number 5? By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before, uh, for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I believe in a transformation. I believe that one of these days the trump is going to sound. The dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. I believe in that. But it's going to be done the old way, according to the old paths. Be careful and mark them who are all about change. And stop, stop thinking about this. Why can't we just let goats be goats? Why can't we let he goats be he goats and nanny goats be nanny goats? Why can't we let lambs be lambs? Why can't we let mice be mice? Why can't we let this bacteria or virus be this bacteria or virus? Why does it have to be changed? Why can't we just let humans be humans and follow Christ? No, we have to change everything. Psalm 102 verse 26, They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shalt thou change them. And they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. The Bible warns us about those who are always going about to change everything. Let God do the changing in your life. Let Him do it. 
This symbol of the goy, the male and the female goat, what it does is it visualizes in the heart of mankind that the spirit of Baphomet is already active, already working, and the plan to transform mankind is proceeding as planned. Your prayer and my prayer is that God will allow us, just as the ark did, to rise up above all of us. This is Pastor Mike. God bless you, and I will see you the next time.